There are several types of medical study designs, each used to answer a different research question. In this video, you will learn about the different types of study designs, what they are used for in medicine, and what are their advantages and disadvantages. So, while researching for this video, we came across contradicting ways for classifying different study designs. These different classifications differ slightly and still transmit the same idea. Therefore, we will describe the classification as taught at our medical school. So, just please bear in mind that other classifications also exist. Um, first off, medical study designs can be divided into descriptive or analytical studies. Descriptive studies, as the name implies, are those designed to describe the distribution of one or more variables in a certain population, without regard to establishing a causal relationship or answering a certain question. Examples of descriptive studies are case reports and case series, cross-sectional studies and ecological studies. Analytical studies, on the other hand, attempt to test a hypothesis and establish a causal relationship between variables. These studies assess the effect of an exposure on, an, on a specific outcome, um, and analytical studies can be observational or experimental or interventional. Observational studies are those where the researcher is merely documenting a naturally occurring relationship between an exposure and the outcome. The researcher does not intervene in any individual and the exposure has already been decided naturally. So, for example, looking at the incidence of lung cancer in smokers versus non-smokers would be an observational study. Again, in this study, the researcher did not play any role in determining if an individual smoked or didn't smoke um, they simply did or didn't. Examples of observational studies could be cohort studies and case control studies. Um, also, cross-sectional studies could also be an analytical study, and we will go on to that uh, in just a bit. Experimental studies, on the other hand, are those where the researcher actively intervenes in some or all members of a group of participants. For example, a study could give aspirin for a group of participants and give a placebo to another group and then compare the effect on the risk of developing cardiovascular events. Um, there are various experimental study designs, but in this video we will talk about randomized controlled trials. So let's talk about case series and case reports. A case report refers to the description of a patient with an unusual disease or with simultaneous occurrence of more than one condition. A case series is an aggregation of multiple reports on similar cases. Many case reports and case series are based on personal accounts and therefore are of limited value. However, some of these bring forward unrecognized diseases and are important for the advancement of medical science. For example, HIV AIDS was first recognized through a case uh, report of disseminated Carposi sarcoma in a young homosexual man and a case series of homosexual men with pneumocystis pneumonia. The advantages of these studies are that they are inexpensive quick, and data is often readily available. However, the downsides are that they refer to a single patient or a small group of patients, and um, they may not be representative of a general population. Cross-sectional studies uh, involve the collection of data on one or more variables as they exist in a defined population at one particular time. This could be, for example, determining the prevalence of sickle cell disease in African children at a particular point in time. If, if these data are analyzed only to determine the distribution of one or more variables, then it is a descriptive cross-sectional study, 
However, if the investigator assesses the relationship between the presence of an exposure and that of an outcome, then it is an analytical cross-sectional study. Cross-sectional studies can be thought of as providing a snapshot of the characteristics of a disease in a population at a particular point in time. These studies are good in determining the prevalence of a disease and thus the disease burden. Cross-sectional studies are often simple to do and inexpensive and they also do not usually pose a challenge from an ethics viewpoint. Um, however, as a disadvantages, um, the results in the study may not represent the true situation in the population. Uh, this could be either from selection bias or measurement bias. Ecological studies involve looking for associations between exposure and an outcome across the population, rather than individuals. So, for example, analyzing the relationship between life expectancy and the percentage of GDP spent on healthcare of European countries during a certain period of time. In this study, the unit of assessment is a country and not an individual. Um, so the advantages of ecological studies are that they are convenient to do since the data have often already been collected by reliable sources. Um, it is particularly useful uh, when the differences in exposure between individuals is much smaller than the differences in exposure between groups. Uh, the disadvantages of these studies, however, are that an association between exposure and outcome at group levels may not be true at individual levels, and that there may be a third factor, known as a confounding factor, uh, that is related to both the exposure and the outcome um, that makes it seem like there is an association between exposure and outcome when, in reality, there may not be. Um, now, cohort studies. In these studies, different groups of people with varying levels of an exposure are accompanied over time to evaluate the occurrence of an outcome. So cohort studies are prospective studies, so in other words, they will see what will happen in the future. Um, an example of a cohort study, for example, is uh, following a group of smokers over time to evaluate the occurrence of lung cancer. The advantages of these studies are that you can establish that the outcome uh, came after the exposure and thus there is a possible causality, meaning that it is an indication that the exposure caused the outcome. Also, for a given exposure, more than one outcome can be analyzed. So, for example, um, we could see the effect of smoking on the incidence of lung cancer and on the incidence of cardiovascular disease, for example. Uh, moreover, multiple exposures can be studied, like age, sex, smoking status, and etc. The disadvantages, however, are that cohort studies require a long time of follow-up. This can take several years or even decades, depending on the study. Also, there could be unknown confounding factors that are not considered. Uh, so for example, people who smoke may also be drinking a lot or making use of illicit drugs, which can affect the outcome. Now, case control studies. In these studies, researchers gather cases or patients with an outcome, so for example, uh, patients with lung cancer, and controls or participants without an outcome so patients without lung cancer, and then try to determine a history of exposure from each group. So therefore, case control studies are retrospective. Um, researchers will try to find differences in exposure of each group. So it is important to note that the two groups of participants should have very similar uh, characteristics. So age, sex, background, 
as to not have any confounding factors. So the advantages of case control studies are that they are often cheap and less time consuming than cohort studies. Um, it is also easy to study the relationship of several exposures with the outcome. And the disadvantages are that it is often hard to determine whether the outcome or the exposure occurred first. There may also be a bias in selecting cases and controls. Um, there may be confounding factors that are not accounted for. And finally, the determination of exposure relies on memory or existing records, both of which may contain wrong or inaccurate data. Now, as of randomized controlled trials, um, in these studies, a group of participants fulfilling a certain criteria is randomly assigned into two separate groups, each receiving a different treatment. So let's say a group of patients with lung cancer would be randomly assigned into a group receiving a new cancer drug and a group receiving a placebo, which is a substance with no therapeutic value. The use of randomization is a major strength in this study, as it allows the control group and the treatment group to be as similar and as representative as possible differing only in the treatment that they receive. The outcomes are then compared between the treatment group and the control group. So let's say the group receiving the new cancer drug presented much better results than the group receiving the placebo. Then this therapeutic action is attributed to the new drug, since in theory the two groups are essentially the same, and yet only varying by the treatment they receive. So the advantages of this study um, are that one treatment is directly compared to another to establish superiority. It minimizes allocation bias and selection bias through the randomization process, and it also makes groups comparable, minimizing confounding factors. It is also considered a gold standard for research. The disadvantages, however, are that it may require a lot of resources um, and it is also often expensive and usually takes a long time. Also, there are some ethical limitations as you cannot ethically randomize patients unless both treatments being compared have equal support in the medical community. So this is the end of the video. I hope you learned something new. If you enjoyed, please leave a like and subscribe.